Good evening, and welcome to Boring Books for Bedtime. I hope tonight's installment provides all the boredom your busy brain needs to quiet down and let you get some sleep for once. So lie back, adjust your volume, take a nice deep breath, and off we go. This evening, we're reading Farm Engines and How to Run Them, The Young Engineer's Guide, a simple, practical handbook for experts as well as for amateurs, fully describing every part of an engine and boiler, giving full directions for the safe and economical management of both. Also, several hundred questions and answers often given in examinations for an engineer's license and chapters on farm engine economy with special attention to traction and gasoline farm engines, and a chapter on the science of successful threshing by James H. Stevenson and other expert engineers, with numerous illustrations showing the different parts of a boiler and engine, and nearly every make of traction engine with a brief description of the distinctive points in each make. Copyright 1903 by Frederick J. Drake and Co. Chicago, Illinois. Let's begin. Preface. This book makes no pretensions to originality. It has taken the best from every source. The author believes the matter has been arranged in a more simple and effective manner and that more information has been crowded into these pages than will be found within the pages of any similar book. The professional engineer, in writing a book for young engineers, is likely to forget that the novice is unfamiliar with many terms which are like daily bread to him. The present writers have tried to avoid that pitfall and to define each term as it naturally needs definition. Moreover, the description of parts and the definitions of terms have preceded any suggestions on operation, the authors believing that the young engineer should become thoroughly familiar with his engine and its manner of working before he is told what is best to do and not to do. If he is forced on too fast, he is likely to get mixed. The test questions at the end of chapter 3 will show how perfectly the preceding pages have been mastered, and the student is not ready to go on till he can answer all these questions readily. The system of questions and answers has its uses and its limitations. The authors have tried to use that system where it would do the most good, and employ the straight narrative discussion method where questions could not help and would only interrupt the progress of thought. Little technical matter has been introduced, and that only for practical purposes. The authors have had traction engines in mind for the most part, but the directions will apply equally well to any kind of steam engine. The thanks of the publishers are due to the various traction engine and threshing machine manufacturers for cuts and information, and especially to the Thresherman's Review for ideas contained in its Farm Engine Economy, to the J.I. Case Threshing Machine Company for the use of copyrighted matter in their The Science of Successful Threshing, and to the manager of the Columbus Machine Company for valuable personal information furnished the authors on gasoline engines and how to run them. The proof has been read and corrected by Mr. T.R. Butman, known in Chicago for 25 years as one of the leading experts on engines and boilers, especially boilers. Chapter 1. Buying an Engine There are a great many makes of good engines on the market today, and the competition is so keen that no engine maker can afford to turn out a very poor engine. This is especially true of traction engines. The different styles and types all have their advantages and are good in their way. For all that, one good engine may be valueless for you 
and there are many ways in which you may make a great mistake in purchasing an engine. The following points will help you to choose wisely. 1. Consider what you want an engine for. If it is a stationary engine, consider the work to be done, the space it is to occupy, and what conveniences will save your time. Remember, time is money, and that means that space is also money. Choose the kind of engine that will be most convenient for the position in which you wish to place it and the purpose or purposes for which you wish to use it. If buying a traction engine, consider also the roads and an engine's pulling qualities. 2. If you are buying a traction engine for threshing, the first thing to consider is fuel. Which will be cheapest for you, wood, coal, or straw? Is economy of fuel much of an object with you? One that will justify you in greater care and more scientific study of your engine? Other things being equal, the direct flue, firebox, locomotive boiler, and simple engine will be the best, since they are the easiest to operate. They are not the most economical under favorable conditions, but a return flue boiler and a compound engine will cost you far more than the possible saving of fuel unless you manage them in a scientific way. Indeed, if not rightly managed, they will waste more fuel than the direct flue locomotive boiler and the simple engine. 3. Do not try to economize on the size of your boiler, and at the same time never get too large an engine. If a 6 horsepower boiler will just do your work, an 8 horsepower will do it better and more economically, because you won't be overworking it all the time. Engines should seldom be crowded. At the same time, you never know when you may want a higher capacity than you have, or how much you may lose by not having it. Of course, you don't want an engine and boiler that are too big but you should always allow a fair margin above your anticipated requirements. 4. Do not try to economize on appliances. You should have a good pump, a good injector, a good heater, an extra steam gauge, an extra fusible plug ready to put in, a flue expander, and a beater. You should also certainly have a good force pump and hose to clean the boiler, and the best oil and grease you can get. Never believe the man who tells you that something not quite the best is just as good. You will find it the most expensive thing you have ever tried, if you have wit enough to find out how expensive it is. 5. If you want my personal advice on the proper engine to select for various purposes, I should say by all means get a gasoline engine for small powers about the farm, such as pumping, etc. It is the quickest to start, by far the most economical to operate, and the simplest to manage. The day of the small steam engine is past and will never return and 10 gasoline engines of this kind are sold for every steam engine put out. If you want a traction engine for threshing, etc., stick to steam. Gasoline engines are not very good hill climbers because the application of power is not steady enough. They are not very good to get out of mud holes with for the same reason, and as yet they are not perfected for such purposes. You might use a portable gasoline engine, however, though the application of power is not as steady as with steam and the flywheels are heavy. In choosing a traction steam engine, the direct flue locomotive boiler and simple engine, though theoretically not so economical as the return flue boiler and compound engine, will in many cases prove so practically because they are so much simpler and there is not the chance to go wrong with them that there is with the others. If for any reason you want a very quick steamer, buy an upright. If a 
economy of fuel is very important, and you are prepared to make the necessary effort to secure it. A return flue boiler will be a good investment, and a really good compound engine may be. Where a large plant is to be operated and a high power constant and steady energy is demanded, stick to steam since the gasoline engines of the larger size have not proved so successful and are certainly by no means so steady. And in such a case, the exhaust steam can be used for heating and for various other purposes that will work the greatest economy. For such a plant, choose a horizontal tubular boiler set in masonry and a compound engine, the latter if you have a scientific engineer. In general, in the traction engine, look to the convenience of arrangement of the throttle, reverse lever, steering wheel, friction clutch, independent pump and injector, all of which should be within easy reach of the footboard, as such an arrangement will save annoyance and often damage when quick action is required. The boiler should be well set. The firebox large, with large great surface if a locomotive type of boiler is used, and the number of flues should be sufficient to allow good combustion without forced draft. A return flue boiler should have a large main flue. Material of the required 5 sixteenths of an inch thickness. A mud drum and 4 to 6 hand holes suitably situated for cleaning the boiler. There should be a rather high average boiler pressure, as high pressure is more economical than low. For a simple engine, 80 pounds, and for a compound, 125 pounds should be minimum. A stationary engine should have a solid foundation built by a mason who understands the business, and should be in a light, dry room, never in a dark cellar or a damp place. Every farm traction engine should have a friction clutch. Chapter 2 Boilers The first boilers were made as a single cylinder of wrought iron set in brickwork, with provision for a fire under one end. This was used for many years, but it produced steam very slowly and with great waste of fuel. The first improvement to be made in this was a fire flue running the whole length of the interior of the boiler, with a fire in one end of the flue. This fire flue was entirely surrounded by water. Then a boiler was made with two flues that came together at the smoke box end. First one flue was fired, and then the other alternately the clear heat of one burning the smoke of the other when it came into the common passage. The next step was to introduce conical tubes by which the water could circulate through the main fire flue, the Galloway boiler. The object of all these improvements was to get a larger heating surface. To make steam rapidly and economically, the heating surface must be as large as possible. But there is a limit in that the boiler must not be cumbersome. But there is a limit in that the boiler must not be cumbersome. It must carry enough water and have sufficient space for steam. The stationary boiler now most commonly used is cylindrical. The fire is built in a brick furnace under the sheet and returns through fire tubes running the length of the boiler. Locomotive fire tube type of boiler. The earliest of the modern steam boilers to come into use was the locomotive fire tube type with a special firebox. By reference to the illustration in Figure 2, Gar Scott and Co.'s locomotive boiler, you will see that the boiler cylinder is perforated with a number of tubes from 2 to 4 inches in diameter running from the large firebox on the left through the boiler cylinder filled with water to the smoke box on the right, above which the smokestack rises. It will be noticed that the walls of the firebox are double, 
and that the water circulates freely all about the firebox, as well as all about the fire tubes. The inner walls of the firebox are held firmly in position by stables, as will be seen in figure three, the Huber firebox, which also shows the position of the grate. Return flue type of boiler. The return flue type of boiler consists of a large central fire flue running through the boiler cylinder to the smoke box at the front end, which is entirely closed. The smoke passes back through a number of small tubes, and the smokestack is directly over the fire at the rear of the boiler. Though there is no communication between the fire at the rear of the boiler and it, except through the main flue to the front and back through the small return flues. Figure 4, the Huber return flue boiler, illustrates this type of boiler, though it shows but one return flue. The actual number may be seen by the sectional view of the Huber return flue boiler in Figure 5. The fire is built in one end of the main flue, and is entirely surrounded by water, as will be seen in the illustration. The long passage for the flame and heated gases enables the water to absorb a maximum amount of the heat of combustion. There is also an element of safety in this boiler, in that the small flues will be exposed first should the water become low and less damage will be done than if the large crown sheet of the firebox boiler is exposed, and this large crown sheet is the first thing to be exposed in that type of boiler. Water tube type of boiler. The special difference between the fire tube boiler and the water tube boiler is that in the former, the fire passes through the tubes, while in the latter, the water is in the tubes, and the fire passes around them. In this type of boiler, there is an upper cylinder, or more than one, filled with water. A series of small tubes running at an angle from the front or fire door end of the upper cylinder to a point below and back of the grates, where they meet in another cylinder or pipe, which is connected with the other end of the upper cylinder. The portions of the tubes directly over the fire will be hottest, and the water here will become heated and rise to the front end of the upper cylinder, while to fill the space left, colder water is drawn in from the back pipe, from the rear end at the upper cylinder, down to the lower ends of the water tubes, to pass along up through them to the front again. This type of boiler gives great heating surface and since the tubes are small, they will have ample strength with much thinner walls. Great freedom of circulation is important in this type of boiler, there being no contracted cells in the passage. This is not adapted for a portable engine. Upright or vertical type of boiler. In the upright type of boiler, the boiler cylinder is placed on end the fire is built at the lower end, which is a firebox surrounded by a water jacket, and the smoke and gases of combustion rise straight up through vertical fire flues. The amount of water carried is relatively small, and the steam space is also small, while the heating surface is relatively large if the boiler is sufficiently tall. You can get up steam in this type of boiler quicker than in any other, and in case of the stationary engine, the space occupied is a minimum. The majority of small stationary engines have this type of boiler, and there is a traction engine with upright boiler which has been widely used, but it is open to the objection that the upper or steam ends of the tubes easily get overheated and so become leaky. There is also often trouble from mud and scale deposits in the water leg, the bottom area of which is very small. Definition of terms used in connection with boilers. Shell. 
the main cylindrical steel sheets which form the principal part of the boiler. Boiler heads. The ends of the boiler cylinder. Tube sheets. The sheets in which the fire tubes are inserted at each end of the boiler. Fire box. A nearly square space at one end of a boiler in which the fire is placed. Properly, it is surrounded on all sides by a double wall. The space between the two shells of these walls being filled with water. All flat surfaces are securely fastened by staples and crown bars, but cylindrical surfaces are self-bracing. Water leg. The space at the sides of the firebox and below it in which water passes. Crown sheet. The sheet of steel at the top of the firebox, just under the water in the boiler. This crown sheet is exposed to severe heat, but so long as it is covered with water, the water will conduct the heat away, and the metal can never become any hotter than the water in the boiler. If, however, it is not covered with water, but only by steam, it quickly becomes overheated, since the steam does not conduct the heat away as the water does. It may become so hot it will soften and sag. But the great danger is that the thin layer of water near this overheated crown sheet will be suddenly turned into a great volume of steam and cause an explosion. If some of the pressure is taken off, this overheated water may suddenly burst into steam and cause an explosion. As the safety valve blows off, for example, since the safety valve relieves some of the pressure. Smoke box. The space at the end of the boiler opposite to that of the fire, in which the smoke may accumulate before passing up the stack in the locomotive type, or through the small flues in the return type of boiler. Steam dome. A drum or projection at the top of the boiler cylinder forming the highest point which the steam can reach. The steam is taken from the boiler through piping leading from the top of this dome, since at this point it is least likely to be mixed with water, either through foaming or shaking up of the boiler. Even under normal conditions, the steam at the top of the dome is drier than anywhere else. Mud Drum a cylindrical shaped receptacle at the bottom of the boiler similar to the steam dome at the top, but not so deep. Impurities in the water accumulate here, and it is of great value on a return flue boiler. In a locomotive boiler, the mud accumulates in the water leg below the firebox. Manholes are large openings into the interior of a boiler through which a man may pass to clean out to the inside. Hand holes are smaller holes at various points in the boiler into which the nozzle of a hose may be introduced for cleaning out the interior. All these openings must be securely covered with steam-tight plates called manhole and handhole plates. Boiler jacket, a non-conducting covering of wood, plaster, hair, rags, felt, paper, asbestos, or the like, which prevents the boiler shell from cooling too rapidly through radiation of heat from the steel. These materials are usually held in place against the boiler by sheet iron. An intervening airspace between the jacket and the boiler shell will add to the efficiency of the jacket. A steam jacket. A space around an engine cylinder or the like, which may be filled with live steam so as to keep the interior from cooling rapidly. Ash pit. The space directly under the grates where the ashes accumulate. Dead plate. 
solid sheets of steel on which the fire lies the same as on the grates, but with no openings through to the ash pit. Dead plates are sometimes used to prevent cold air passing through the fire into the flues, and are common on straw-burning boilers. They should seldom, if ever, be used on coal or wood-firing boilers. Great Surface The whole space occupied by the great bars, usually measured in square feet. Forced Draft a draft produced by any means other than the natural tendency of the heated gases of combustion to rise. For example, a draft caused by letting steam escape into the stack. Heating surface. The entire surface of the boiler exposed to the heat of the fire, or the area of steel or iron sheeting or tubing on one side of which is water and on the other, heated air or gases. Steam space. The cubicle contents of the space which may be occupied by steam above the water. Water space. The cubicle contents of the space occupied by water below the steam. Diaphragm plate. A perforated plate used in the domes of locomotive boilers to prevent water dashing into the steam supply pipe. A dry pipe is a pipe with small perforations, used for taking steam from the steam space instead of from a dome with diaphragm plate. The Attachments of a Boiler Before proceeding to a consideration of the care and management of a boiler, let us briefly indicate the chief working attachments of a boiler. Unless the nature and uses of these attachments are fully understood, it will be impossible to handle the boiler in a thoroughly safe and scientific fashion, though some engineers do handle boilers without knowing all about these attachments. Their ignorance in many cases costs them their lives and the lives of others. The first duty of the engineer is to see that the boiler is filled with water. This he usually does by looking at the glass water gauge. The water gauge and cocks. There is a cock at each end of the glass tube. When these cocks are open, the water will pass through the lower into the glass tube, while steam comes through the other. The level of the water in the gauge will then be the same as the level of the water in the boiler, and the water should never fall out of sight below the lower end of the glass, nor rise above the upper end. Below the lower gauge cock, there is another cock used for draining the gauge and blowing it off when there is a pressure of steam on. By occasionally opening this cock, allowing the heated water or steam to blow through it, the engineer may always be sure that the passages into the water gauge are not stopped up by any means. By closing the upper cock and opening the lower, the passage into the lower may be cleared by blowing off the drain cock. By closing the lower gauge cock and opening the upper, the passage from the steam space may be cleared and tested in the same way when the drain cock is opened. If the glass breaks, both upper and lower gauge cocks should be closed instantly. In addition to the glass water gauge, there are the try cocks for ascertaining the level of the water in the boiler. There should be two to four of these. They open directly out of the boiler sheet, and by opening them in turn, it is possible to tell approximately where the water stands. There should be one cock near the level of the crown sheet, or slightly above it, another about the level of the lower gauge cock, another about the middle of the gauge, another about the level of the upper gauge, and still another, perhaps, a little higher. But one above and one below the water line will be sufficient. If water 
river stands above the level of the cock, it will blow off white mist when opened. If the cock opens from steam space, it will blow off blue steam when opened. The tricocks should be opened from time to time in order to be sure that the water stands at the proper level in the boiler, for various things may interfere with the workings of the glass gauge. Tricocks are often called gauge cocks. The steam gauge. The steam gauge is a delicate instrument arranged so as to indicate by a pointer the pounds of pressure which the steam is exerting within the boiler. It is extremely important, and a defect in it may cause much damage. The steam gauge was invented in 1849 by Eugene Bourdon of France. He discovered that a flat tube bent in a simple curve, held fast at one end, would expand and contract if made of proper spring material through the pressure of the water within the tube. The free end operates a clockwork that moves the pointer. It is important that the steam gauge be attached to the boiler by a siphon or with a knot in the tube so that the steam may operate on water contained in the tube and the water cannot become displaced by steam since steam might interfere with the correct working of the gauge by expanding the gauge tube through its excessive heat. Steam gauges frequently get out of order and should be tested occasionally. This may conveniently be done by attaching them to a boiler which has a correct gauge already on it. If both register alike, it is probable that both are accurate. There are also self-testing steam gauges. With all pressure off, the pointer will return to zero. Then a series of weights are arranged which may be hung on the gauge and cause the pointer to indicate corresponding numbers. The chief source of variation is in the loosening of the indicator needle. This shows itself usually when the pressure is off and the pointer does not return exactly to zero. Safety Valve The safety valve is a valve held in place by a weighted lever or by a spiral spring on traction engines or some similar device and is adjustable by a screw or the like so that it can be set to blow off at a given pressure of steam, usually the rated pressure of the boiler, which on traction engines is from 110 to 130 pounds. The valve is supplied with a handle by which it can be opened and it should be opened occasionally to make sure it is working all right. When it blows off, the steam gauge should be noted to see that it agrees with the pressure for which the safety valve was set. If they do not agree, something is wrong. Either the safety valve does not work freely or the steam gauge does not register accurately. The illustration above shows the Kunkel safety valve. To set it, unscrew the jam nut and apply the key to the pressure screw. For more pressure, screw down. For less, unscrew. After having the desired pressure, screw the jam nut down tight on the pressure screw. To regulate the opening and closing of the valve, take the pointed end of a file and apply it to the teeth of the regulator. If the valve closes with too much boiler pressure, move the regulator to the left. If with too little, move the regulator to the right. Other types of valves are managed in a similar way, and exact directions will always be furnished by the manufacturer. Filling the boiler with water. There are three ways in which a boiler is commonly filled with water. First, before starting a boiler, it must be filled with water by hand or with a hand force pump. There is usually a filler plug which must be taken out and a funnel can be attached in its place. Open one of the gauge cocks to let out the air as the water goes in. When the boiler has a sufficient amount of water, 
as may be seen by the glass water gauge. Replace the filler plug. After steam is up, the boiler should be supplied with water by a pump or injector. The boiler pump. There are two kinds of pumps commonly used on traction engines, the independent pump and the crosshead pump. The independent pump is virtually an independent engine with pump attached. There are two cylinders, one receiving steam and conveying force to the piston, the other a water cylinder in which a plunger works, drawing the water into itself by suction and forcing it out through the connection pipe into the boiler by force of steam pressure in the steam cylinder. It is to be noted that all suction pumps receive their water by reason of the pressure of the atmosphere on the surface of the water in the supply tank or well. This atmospheric pressure is about 15 pounds to the square inch and is sufficient to support a column of water 28 to 33 feet high, 33 feet being the height of a column of water which the atmosphere will support theoretically at about sea level. At greater altitudes, the pressure of the atmosphere decreases. Pumps do not work very well when drawing water from a depth over 20 or 22 feet. Water can be forced to almost any height by pressure of steam on a plunger, and it is taken from deep wells by deep well pumps, which suck the water 20 to 25 feet and force it the rest of the way by pressure on a plunger. The amount of water pumped is regulated by a cock or globe valve in the suction pipe. A crosshead boiler pump is a pump attached to the crosshead of an engine. The force of the engine piston is transmitted to the plunger of the pump. The pump portion works exactly the same, whether of the independent or crosshead kind. The illustration below represents an independent pump that uses the exhaust steam to heat the water as it is pumped. The Marsh Pump. Every boiler feed pump must have at least two check valves. A check valve is a small swinging gate valve, usually contained in a pipe, and so arranged that when water is flowing in one direction, the valve will automatically open to let the water pass, while if water should be forced in the other direction, the valve will automatically close tight and prevent the water from passing. There is one check valve in the supply pipe which conducts the water from the tank or well to the pump cylinder. When the plunger is drawn back or raised, a vacuum is created in the pump cylinder and the outside atmospheric pressure forces water through the supply line into the cylinder and the check valve opens to let it pass. When the plunger returns, the check valve closes and the water is forced into the feed pipe to the boiler. There are usually two check valves between the pump cylinder and the boiler, both swinging away from the pump or toward the boiler. In order that the water may flow steadily into the boiler, there is an air chamber which may be partly filled with water at each stroke of the plunger. As the water comes in, the air must be compressed and as it expands, it forces the water through the feed pipe into the boiler in a steady stream. There is one check valve between the pump cylinder and the air chamber to prevent the water from coming back into the cylinder, and another between the air chamber and the boiler to prevent the steam pressure forcing itself or the water from the boiler or water heater back into the air chamber. All three of these check valves must work easily and fit tight if the pump is to be serviceable. They usually close with rubber facings, which in time will get worn, and dirt is liable to work into the hinge and otherwise prevent tight and easy closing. They can always be opened for inspection, and new ones can be put in when the old are too much worn.
only cold water can be pumped successfully, as steam from hot water will expand and so prevent a vacuum being formed. Thus, no suction will take place to draw the water from the supply source. There should always be a clove valve or cock in the feed pipe near the boiler to make it possible to cut out the check valves when the boiler is under pressure. It is never to be closed, except when required for this purpose. Before passing into the boiler, the water from the pump goes through the heater. This is a small cylinder with a coil of pipe inside. The feed pipe from the pump is connected with one end of this inner coil of pipe, while the other end of the coil leads into the boiler itself. The exhaust steam from the engine cylinder is emitted into the cylinder and passes around the coil of pipe, afterwards coming out of the smokestack to help increase the draft. As the feed water passes through this heater, it becomes heated nearly to boiling before it enters the boiler and has no tendency to cool the boiler off. Heating the feed water results in an economy of about 10%. The injector is another means of forcing water from a supply tank or well into the boiler, and at the same time heating it by use of steam from the boiler. It is a necessity when a crosshead pump is used, since such a pump will not work when the engine is shut down. It is useful in any case to heat the water before it goes into the boiler when the engine is not working and there is no exhaust steam for the heater. There are various types of injectors, but they all work on practically the same principle. The steam from the boiler is led through a tapering nozzle to a small chamber into which there is an opening from a water supply pipe. This steam nozzle throws out its spray with great force and creates a partial vacuum in the chamber, causing the water to flow in. As the pressure of the steam has been reduced when it passes into the injector, it cannot, of course, force its way back into the boiler at first and finds an outlet at the overflow. When the water comes in, however, the steam jet strikes the water and is condensed by it. At the same time, it carries the water and the condensed steam along toward the boiler with such force that the back pressure of the boiler is overcome and a stream of heated water is passed into it. In order that the injector may work, its parts must be nicely adjusted and with varying steam pressures it takes some ingenuity to get it started. Usually the full steam pressure is turned on and the cock admitting the water supply is opened a varying amount according to the pressure. First, the valve between the check valve and the boiler should be opened so that the feed water may enter freely. Then open wide the valve next the steam dome and any other valve between the steam supply pipe and the injector. Lastly, open the water supply valve if water appears at the overflow, close the supply valve and open it again, giving it just the proper amount of turn. The injector is regulated by the amount of water admitted. In setting up an injector of any type, the following rules should be observed. All connecting pipes as straight and short as possible. The internal diameter of all connecting pipes should be the same or greater than the diameter of the hole in the corresponding part of the injector. When there is dirt or particles of wood or other material in the source of water supply, the end of the water supply pipe should be provided with a strainer. Indeed, invariably, a strainer should be used. The holes in this strainer must be as small as the smallest opening in the delivery tube, and the total area of the openings in the strainer must be greater than the area of the water supply in cross-section. The steam should be taken from the highest part of the dome to avoid carrying any water from the boiler over with it. 
wet steam cuts and grooves the steam nozzle. The steam should not be taken from the pipe leading to the engine unless the pipe is quite large. Before using new injectors, after they are fitted to the boiler, it is advisable to disconnect them and clean them out well by letting steam blow through them or forcing water through. This will prevent lead or loose scale getting into the injector when in use. Set the injector as low as possible as it works best with smallest possible lift. Ejectors and jet pumps are used for lifting and forcing water by steam pressure and are employed in filling tanks, etc. Blast and blow off devices. In traction engines, there is a small pipe with a valve leading into the smokestack from the boiler. When the valve is opened, the steam allowed to blow off into the smokestack will create a vacuum and so increase the draft. Blast and blow pipes are used only in starting the fire and are of little value before the steam pressure reaches 15 pounds or so. The exhaust nozzle from the engine cylinder also leads into the smokestack, and when the engine is running, the exhaust steam is sufficient to keep up the draft without using the blower. Blow-off cocks are used for blowing sediment out of the bottom of a boiler, or blowing scum off the top of the water to prevent foaming. A boiler should never be blown out at high pressure, as there is great danger of injuring it. Better to let the boiler cool off somewhat before blowing off. Spark Arrester Traction engines are supplied as a usual thing with spark arresters if they burn wood or straw. Coal sparks are heavy and have little life, and with some engines no spark arrester is needed. But there is great danger of setting a fire if an engine is run with wood or straw without the spark arrester. Spark arresters are of different types. The most usual form is a large screen dome placed over the top of the stack. This screen must be kept well cleaned by brushing, or the draft of the engine will be impaired by it. In another form of spark arrester, the smoke is made to pass through water, which effectually kills every possible spark. The diamond spark arrester does not interfere with the draft and is so constructed that all sparks are carried by a counter current through a tube into a pail where water is kept. The inverted cone, as shown in the illustration above, is made of steel wire cloth, which permits smoke and gas to escape, but no spark. There is no possible chance to set fire to anything by sparks. It is adapted to any steam engine that exhausts into the smokestack. Unless otherwise indicated, illustrations of fittings in these chapters show those manufactured by the Lunkenheimer Company of Cincinnati, Ohio. And with that, I think we'll call it a night on farm engines and how to run them. The Young Engineer's Guide by James H. Stevenson and other expert engineers. That was a lot of information. If steam engines ever come back into vogue, we'll all have a leg up. Hopefully, however, you're no longer awake to hear this. If you are and you'd like something else to do, Perhaps you'll consider leaving a positive rating or review on iTunes or the podcast provider through which you are listening to this. It's very helpful. If you're interested in reading tonight's work for yourself, you'll find a link to it on our Goodreads page, which includes a library of everything read on this podcast. Just go to goodreads.com slash boringbookspod. If you'd like to connect, or suggest a boring book you'd like to hear read, catch me on Twitter at BoringBooksPod. I'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much for joining me this evening. 
Until our next boring book, good night.